The tank is best suited to fighting in open country, firm, level terrain. Like the battlefields of Combray, the western desert of North Africa and the North German Plain. That's because this is the sort of ground that maximises the potency of the weapon system, allowing tanks to manoeuvre in unit formations and to identify and destroy targets at range with minimal visual obstructions. But battlefields generally aren't chosen with the convenience of tank crews in mind, and you only have to look at conditions at Ypres uh, on the Eastern Front or Vietnam uh, to know that the effectiveness of the tank can be hamstrung by conditions on the ground. But if open warfare is tank heaven, urban warfare is tank hell, as it effectively strips the tank of all its key fighting advantages. And since the First World War, we've seen the tanks struggle to handle the restrictions of fighting in villages, towns and cities. So in this video, we're looking at how the tank and its crew have evolved to tackle the challenges of urban warfare. This video has been made possible by our supporters on Patreon, our YouTube members, and our super thanks donors. Please join them if you can, and support the Tank Museum. And thanks for watching. On November the 20th, 1917, the Tank Corps spearheaded the Battle of Combray. It was the first mass use of the tank, and initially at least, it was a massive success. 476 tanks attacked along a six mile wide front, and gained more ground than any previous Allied assault since the Great War began. One of the reasons for their success was the choice of ground. It was firm and unbroken by previous battles. And this, as Hugh Ellis, the Tank Corps commander, realised, was exactly what the tanks needed to show what they could do. And they did. But the early momentum of the battle was lost. Three days after the main attack, Around a dozen tanks attempted to take the village of Fontaine Notre Dame outside Combray. Here, things did not go so smoothly. Separated from their supporting infantry and hemmed in by the houses of the village, the tanks were stalked and hunted down by squads of German infantry armed with grenades, and six were destroyed. The contrast between this and the success of the initial attack really illustrates the problems that are going to haunt tank crews over successive generations. Over the course of the last hundred years, tanks have increasingly found themselves forced to operate in complex terrain, in large urban areas. But the challenges remain the same. Whether you're in the streets of Fontaine Notre Dame, Stalingrad, Fallujah, Aleppo or Mariupol, the best attributes of the tank, mobility and firepower, are heavily restricted. Narrow streets limit sightlines and turret traverse, as well as making manoeuvre of large vehicles very difficult. Today, collateral damage against buildings, infrastructure, and especially the civilian population uh, is a real challenge. But it's not the only one. I mean, to begin with, visibility from inside a tank is distinctly limited at the best of times. As far as situation awareness goes, uh, the only crew member with 360 degree vision is the commander sitting where I'm sitting, because he's got a cupola with vision blocks all the way round. The gunner has about a 30 degree uh, vision display wherever the turret happens to be pointing. The loader operator, about 120 degrees, sort of more or less sideways from the turret, and the driver about 45 degrees forwards. Now here's the thing. There is a blind spot that extends about 10 metres around the sides and the back of the tank. Now in open country that isn't such a problem because it's difficult to get up close without being noticed. But in an urban environment that means that an enemy could conceivably get very close to the vehicle without being seen and be able to inflict damage. Anyone who's watched Saving Private Ryan will remember the sequence where the advantage of the armoured column is neutralised by a platoon of rangers when it's drawn into the main street of the town. You'll remember how the defenders use the upper floors of the buildings to drop Molotov cocktails and the rubble to get close enough to throw demolition charges at the tracks. 
By 2030, it's been estimated that 75% of the world's population will live in an urban environment. If that's the case, that's where wars are going to be fought. And tanks and their crews are going to have to learn to operate more and more in these conditions. To understand how the crews are learning to adapt, we need to look at some examples from the past. The Battle of Stalingrad stands as probably the ultimate example of how hellish urban warfare can be. The Panzer III was the most numerous tank that the German army had at Stalingrad. And the crews began to realize quite rapidly how vulnerable they were in that environment. The threat was 360 degrees during what the Germans called Der Rattenkrieg, the Rats War. And the defenders would use ruined buildings, rooftops, cellars, even drains and sewers to stalk and outflank enemy armor. People who haven't got much experience with tanks tend to regard them as impregnable steel fortresses, but they do in fact have quite a lot of weaknesses. Now on any tank, thickest armor is at the front, so the glassy and the front of the turret, but it's thinner, and this is to save weight on the belly plates, down the sides and at the rear. And the back decks, the rear decks are thinly armored and they also have louvers for ventilation of the engine. Now these are the weaknesses that the defenders of Stalingrad would seek to exploit. Their ability to move quickly through the debris could swing the advantage in their favor and allow the infantry to get close enough to put tanks out of action with all manner of anti-tank weapons. What both sides realized was the importance of close infantry tank cooperation. Lieutenant General V.I. Chuikov, the commander of the 2nd Army at Stalingrad, stated that whenever we are able to separate enemy infantry and tanks, both suffered. Red Army tactics exploited this weakness. Tanks were used in packets of three or four to support a company of infantry. The defenders would not fire on the tanks alone, but they'd allow them to pass through into the screen of dug-in T-34s and anti-tank guns. The German army was constantly forced to use infantry to draw the defenders' fire. In support of the infantry, German tanks would constantly have to cover one another while battering away at buildings at point-blank range. With a tall or substantial building, this was wasteful and ineffective. AP rounds knocked holes in walls, caused minimal damage. HE was better, but the limited elevation of the gun in a confined area meant that anything above the second floor was untouched. In the confusion of the ruins of the city, coordination with artillery and air assets was extremely challenging. The Modern War Institute of West Point states that the principal lesson you can derive from Stalingrad was the importance of all arms cooperation. Armour, infantry, engineers, artillery and mortars must be trained together to achieve the high level of cooperation, teamwork and tactical capability required by high intensity combat in dense urban terrain. Variations of the events of Stalingrad we played out in towns and cities across the whole of Europe for the rest of the war. This includes one of the most famous incidents of the period, the Panther versus Pershing duel in front of Cologne Cathedral. Atypical because of its setting and the fact it was recorded on film, this was one of many similar combats as the war came to a conclusion. The main disadvantage in operating MBTs in an urban environment, though, is their size and therefore their lack of manoeuvrability. In the 1968 Battle for Hue City, part of the Tet Offensive during the Vietnam War, the US Marine Corps found that the M50 Ontos, a small tracked vehicle mounting six recallless rifles, had advantages over tanks because their shorter chassis gave better manoeuvrability. But a combination of the two was even better. The M48s provided protection and firepower, while the Ontos provided firepower and mobility, so each offset the weaknesses of the other. And the dismounted Marines they were working with were protected by the armed vehicles, and in turn were able to protect them. To make this sort of cooperation work, infantry and tanks need to train together. And for that to be effective, you need the sort of exercise environment where they can pick up and practice the necessary skills. 
The British Army has Fibua, fighting in built-up areas training facilities, Imba and Cope Hill Down in Wiltshire. But certainly the best in Europe is Senza, the Centre d'Entraînement en Action Zone Urbaine, near Sisson in northeastern France. This facility has two main areas, the village of Beausejour and Joffrecourt, a reconstructed town of 6,000 inhabitants with a traditional town centre, suburbs and industrial zone simulating a typical European mid-sized town, plus a realistic urban live fire training complex. The dangers of urban warfare are as much for the infantry as the tanks. A lot of those dangers actually come from the tanks themselves. Now, if you're anywhere near the front of this vehicle and it fires around, the blast from the muzzle is going to extend in an arc 150 metres forward of the tank. And also, if they're firing Sabo, the petals are going to come out at terrific speed as well. Being anywhere near the front of this tank when it fires its main armament is a very, very dangerous place to be. For an infantryman, communicating with a closed-down tank is extremely risky. You have to remember the tank crew probably can't see you, and the tank might do something unexpected like reversing and turn you into a red smear on the road. To make comms easier, tank designers have tried various things. Uh, the Japanese hard go has got a little bell push on the back, which is disguised as a rivet. Right through to this, this is the British chieftain. And here, we have an infantry telephone. This need to communicate continues, especially in urban ops. And as recently as 2006, M1 Abrams were equipped with phones mounted above the right rear track as part of the Tusk tank urban survivability kit upgrade. In spite of the limitations, MBTs are still very important in urban operations. Combination of firepower and armour protection means there are times when only a tank can do the job. In US operations in Sada City, Iraq in March 2008, striker IFVs had to be withdrawn replaced by M1 Abrams and Bradley IFVs after six were destroyed by a combination of IEDs and RPGs. The lighter armour just wasn't up to it. But there are occasions when MBTs are not invulnerable, and this is particularly so when equipment and crew training aren't of the highest quality. Footage from Syria shows insurgents knocking out Syrian army tanks with RPGs time and time again. Even a tank as well protected as the US Abrams or British Challenger II can be damaged by anti-tank weapons. So in recent decades, protection has been increased accordingly, particularly in the addition of ERA. In Basra, a Challenger II was struck by 70 RPG-7s without critical structural damage, most of the strikes just producing black splatter on the armour. More serious, though, was an RPG-29 strike uh, during the fighting at Alamara in 2006. This penetrated, it defeated explosive reactive armour and actually wounded the driver. The answer to this was the Theatre Entry Standard Upgrade, TES. This replaced ERA, which can be defeated by multiple hits or tandem charge warheads, by additional Dorchester II composite armour. The trade-off for this is that the tank now weighs in 74 tonnes. Tank gunnery can still be effective um, fighting in a built-up area, but Western militaries in particular try to limit collateral damage. That is damage to property and casualties to the civilian population. British tank crews in Iraq in 2003 found a novel way of making their tank gunnery far more surgical. The standard 120mm Hesch round fired by the Challenger's gun is very powerful and likely to remove entire buildings and their occupants. If, on the other hand, the round fired is a practice round, a drill round like this one, it's just full of concrete. So that will, say, take out a single sniper, a single room, rather than demolishing half the street. Other lessons from fighting a near-peer enemy have seen MBTs and vehicles like the Scimitar equipped with ECM kit, electronic countermeasures. That's usually visible as sort of boxes on the front and there's the spoiler on the back fitted with aerials. 
What that does is to generate an electronic jamming bubble around the vehicle, and that prevents the remote detonation of IEDs via a radio signal when the vehicle is in range. Given the increasing urbanisation of the planet, uh, I don't think there's any doubt that tanks will increasingly have to operate in complex terrain. Looking at past precedent, it seems that a lot of the time it's not a question of prior preparation, but it's disaster followed by improvisation, whether that's in training or tactics or equipment. Looking at previous instances in places like Syria and Ukraine, it's obvious that it's very, very easy to get this badly wrong. Getting it right means thorough preparation and training, uh, and especially infantry tank cooperation. Getting it right also means having uh, the right kit, having the right vehicles in place uh, in the right strength and modified where necessary to the environment. That way armour can be used to best effect with least risk to both friendly forces and the civilian population. Finally, there's no doubt that armour brings something unique to the equation. Now, putting it crudely, you could call this the f off factor. To quote a friend of mine, an experienced British Army tank commander, he said, if I turn up in something with wheels, the uglies will take a pop at me. But on the other hand, if I'm sitting in 64 tonnes of metal, they'll scuttle off back into their holes. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please subscribe. And if you can, support us on Patreon.